Hey guys, welcome back to another world audiobooks. We are carrying on with the return of Tarzan and what a return he has made. He's trotting the globe, checking out all different corners of the world. I uh, hope you enjoyed last week's chapter and this week's chapter. Man, uh, it was it was a doozy to record. This was really tricky. There's a lot of uh, words and stuff that uh, were very difficult to pronounce. So I apologize if I got any of those wrong. I did my best. I looked up <laughs> pronunciations for everything I could find. I don't know if like city names have changed or what, but but I, I just straight up couldn't find pronunciations for all the, the stuff that's mentioned. So my apologies if I got anything wrong. It was not on purpose. Anyway, I hope you guys are enjoying this. Uh, I hope you are telling other people about the podcast. That is the biggest thing that you can do. And I wanted to mention again, if you go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com, you can get a free audiobook. That is right. I'm giving away free audiobooks here on the podcast in serialized format. But if you would like it all in one nice meaty chunk of audiobook goodness, you can just go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com and it's one of the first things you'll see on there is that you can select uh, get your free audiobook and just let me know which one you want and where to send it and boom, you'll have a free audiobook. So, and now, without further ado, let's get into this chapter, shall we? Chapter 7 The Dancing Girl of C.D. Isa Tarzan's first mission did not bid fair to be either exciting or vastly important, there was a certain lieutenant of Spahi, whom the government had reason to suspect of improper relations with the great European power. This lieutenant Jernois, who was at present stationed at Sidi Bel Abbes, had recently been attached to the general staff, where certain information of great military value had come into his possession in the ordinary routine of his duties. It was this information which the government suspected the great power was bartering for with the officer. It was at most but a vague hint, dropped by a certain notorious Parisian in a jealous mood, that had caused suspicion to rest upon the lieutenant. But general staffs are jealous of their secrets, and treason so serious a thing that even a hint of it may not be safely neglected. And so it was that Tarzan had come to Algeria, in the guise of an American hunter and traveller, to keep a close eye upon Lieutenant Genois. He had looked forward with keen delight to again seeing his beloved Africa, but this northern aspect of it was so different from his tropical jungle home that he might as well have been back in Paris for all the heart thrills of homecoming that he experienced. At Oran, he spent a day wandering through the narrow, crooked alleys of the Arab quarter, enjoying the strange new sights. The next day found him at Sidi Bel Abbes, where he presented his letters of introduction to both civil and military authorities, letters which gave no clue to the real significance of his mission. Tarzan possessed a sufficient command of English to enable him to pass among Arabs and Frenchmen as an American, and that was all that was required of it. When he met an Englishman, he spoke French, in order that he might not betray himself, but occasionally talked in English to foreigners who understood that tongue, but could not note the slight imperfections of accent and pronunciation that were his. Here, he became acquainted with many of the French officers, and soon became a favourite among them. He met Jeanois, whom he found to be a taciturn, dyspeptic-looking man of about forty, having little or no social intercourse with his fellows. For a month, nothing a moment occurred. Jeanois had no visitors, nor did he on his occasional visits to the town hold communication with any who might even, by the wildest flights of imagination, be construed into secret agents of a foreign power. Tarzan was beginning to hope that, after all, the rumour might have been false, when suddenly Jeanois was ordered to the Bao Sa'ad in the Petite Sahara, far to the south. A company of Spahi and three officers were to relieve another company already stationed there. Fortunately, one of the officers, Captain Gerard, had become an excellent friend of Tarzan's, and so, when the ape-man suggested that he should embrace the opportunity of accompanying him to Bao Sa'ad, where he expected to find hunting, it caused not the slightest suspicion. At Bao Ira, the detachment detrained, and the balance of the journey was made in the saddle. As Tarzan was dickering at Bao Ira for a mount, he caught a brief glimpse of a man in European clothes, eyeing him from the doorway of a native coffee-house. But, as Tarzan looked, the man turned and entered the little, low-ceilinged mud hut, and, but for a haunting impression that there had been something familiar about the face or figure of the fellow, Tarzan gave the matter no further thought. 
The march to our mall was fatiguing to Tarzan, whose equestrian experiences hitherto had been confined to a course of riding lessons in a Parisian academy, and so it was that he quickly sought the comforts of a bed in the Hotel Grassard, while the officers and troops took up their quarters at the military post. Although Tarzan was called early the following morning, the company of Spahis was on the march before he had finished his breakfast. He was hurrying through his meal that the soldiers might not get too far in advance of him when he glanced through the door connecting the dining room with the bar. To his surprise, he saw Joan Wall standing there in conversation with the very stranger he had seen in the coffee house at Bauira the day previous. He could not be mistaken, for there was the same strangely familiar attitude and figure, though the man's back was toward him. As his eyes lingered on the two, Joan Wall looked up and caught the intent expression on Tarzan's face. The stranger was talking in a low whisper at the time, but the French officer immediately interrupted him, and the two at once turned away and passed out of the range of Tarzan's vision. This was the first suspicious occurrence that Tarzan had ever witnessed in connection with Joan Wall's actions, but he was positive that the men had left the barroom solely because Joan Wall had caught Tarzan's eye upon them. Then there was the persistent impression of familiarity about the stranger to further augment the ape-man's belief that here at length was something which could bear watching. A moment later, Tarzan entered the barroom, but the men had left. Nor did he see aught of them in the street beyond, though he found a pretext to ride to various shops before he set out after the column which had now a considerable start on him. He did not overtake them until he reached Sidi Isa shortly after noon, where the soldiers had halted for an hour's rest. Here he found Jean War with the column, but there was no sign of the stranger. It was market day at Sidi Isa, and the numberless caravans of camels coming in from the desert and the crowds of bickering Arabs in the marketplace filled Tarzan with a consuming desire to remain for a day that he might see more of these sons of the desert. Thus it was that the company of Spahis marched on that afternoon toward Baal Sa'ad without him. He spent the hours until dark wandering about the market in company of a youthful Arab, one Abdul, who had been recommended to him by the innkeeper as a trustworthy servant and interpreter. Here, Tarzan purchased a better mount than the one he had selected at Bauira, and entering into conversation with the stately Arab to whom the animal had belonged, learned that the seller was Kadur bin Sardin, sheikh of a desert tribe far south of Jelfa. Through Abdul, Tarzan invited his new acquaintance to dine with him. As the three were making their way through the crowds of marketers, camels, donkeys, and horses that filled the marketplace with a confusing babble of sounds, Abdul plucked at Tarzan's sleeve. Look, master, behind us! And he turned, pointing at a figure which disappeared behind a camel as Tarzan turned. He has been following us all afternoon, continued Abdul. I caught only a glimpse of an Arab in a dark blue burnous and white turban replied Tarzan. Is it he, you mean? Yes, I suspect him because he seems a stranger here, without other business than following us, which is not the way of the Arab who is honest, and also because he keeps the lower part of his face hidden, only his eyes showing. He must be a bad man, or he would have honest business of his own to occupy his time. He is on the wrong scent then, Abdul, replied Tarzan, for no one here can have any grievance against me. This is my first visit to your country, and no one knows me. He will soon discover his error, and cease to follow us. Unless he be bent on robbery, returned Abdul. Then all we can do is wait until he is ready to try his hand upon us, laughed Tarzan, and I warrant that he will get his belly full of robbing now that we are prepared for him. And so he dismissed the subject from his mind, though he was destined to recall it before many hours through a most unlooked-for occurrence. Kadur bin Sardin, having dined well, prepared to take leave of his host. With dignified protestations of friendship, he invited Tarzan to visit him in his wild domain, where the antelope, the stag, the boar, the panther, and the lion might be found in sufficient numbers to tempt an ardent huntsman. On his departure, the ape-man with Abdul wandered again into the streets of Sidi Isa, where he was soon attracted by the wild din of sound coming from the open doorway of one of the numerous Café Mao. It was after eight, and the dancing was in full swing as Tarzan entered. The room was filled to repletion with Arabs. All were smoking and drinking their thick, hot coffee. Tarzan and Abdul found seats near the centre of the room, 
though the terrific noise produced by the musicians upon their Arab drums and pipes would have rendered a seat farther from them more acceptable to the quiet loving ape man. A rather good looking girl was dancing, and perceiving Tarzan's European clothes, and scenting a generous gratuity, she threw her silken handkerchief upon his shoulder to be rewarded with a franc. When her place upon the floor had been taken by another, the bright eyed Abdul saw her in conversation with two Arabs at the far side of the room, near a side door that led upon an inner court, around the gallery of which were the rooms occupied by the girls who danced in this cafe. At first, he thought nothing of the matter, but presently he noticed from the corner of his eye one of the men nod in their direction, and the girl turn and shoot a furtive glance at Tarzan. Then the Arabs melted through the doorway into the darkness of the court. When it came again the girl's turn to dance, she hovered close to Tarzan, and for the ape-man alone were her sweetest smiles. Many an ugly scowl was cast upon the tall European by swarthy, dark-eyed sons of the desert, but neither smiles nor scowls produced any outwardly visible effect upon him. Again the girl cast her handkerchief upon his shoulder, and again she was rewarded with a frank piece. As she was sticking it upon her forehead, after the custom of her kind, she bent low toward Tarzan, whispering a quick word in his ear. "'There are two without in the court,' she said quickly, in broken French. "'Who would harm, monsieur? At first I promised to lure you to them, but you have been so kind, and I cannot do it. Go quickly, before they find that I have failed them. I think they are very bad men.' Tarzan thanked the girl, assuring her that he would be careful, and, having finished her dance, she crossed to the little doorway and went out into the court. But Tarzan did not leave the café as she had urged. For another half-hour, nothing unusual occurred. Then, a surly-looking Arab entered the café from the street. He stood near Tarzan, where he deliberately made insulting remarks about the European. But, as they were in his native tongue, Tarzan was entirely innocent of their purport until Abdul took it upon himself to enlighten him. "'This fellow is looking for trouble,' warned Abdul. "'He is not alone. In fact, in case of a disturbance, nearly every man here would be against you. It would be better to leave quietly, master.' "'Ask the fellow what he wants,' commanded Tarzan. "'He says that the dog of a Christian insulted the dancing girl who belongs to him. He means trouble, monsieur.' "'Tell him that I did not insult his or any other dancing girl, that I wish him to go away and leave me alone.' that I have no quarrel with him, nor has he any with me. He says, replied Abdul, after delivering his message to the Arab, that besides being a dog yourself, that you are the son of one, and that your grandmother was a hyena. Incidentally, you are a liar. The attention of those nearby had now been attracted by the altercation, and the sneering laughs that followed this torrent of invective easily indicated the trend of the sympathies of the majority of the audience. Tarzan did not like being laughed at, neither did he relish the terms applied to him by the Arab, but he showed no sign of anger as he arose from his seat upon the bench. A half-smile played about his lips, but of a sudden a mighty fist shot into the face of the scowling Arab, and back of it were the terrible muscles of the ape-man. At the instant that the man fell, a half-dozen fierce plainsmen sprang to the room from where they had been apparently waiting for their cue in the street before the café. With cries of, "'Kill the unbeliever!' and down with the dog of a Christian, they made straight for Tarzan. A number of the younger Arabs in the audience sprang to their feet to join in the assault upon the unarmed white man. Tarzan and Abdul were rushed back toward the end of the room by the very force of numbers opposing them. The young Arab remained loyal to his master, and with drawn knife fought at his side. With tremendous blows, the ape-man felled all who came within reach of his powerful hands. He fought quietly, and without a word, upon his lips the same half-smile they had worn as he rose to strike down the man who had insulted him. It seemed impossible that either he or Abdul could survive the sea of wicked-looking swords and knives that surrounded them, but the very numbers of their assailants proved the best bulwark of their safety. So closely packed was the howling, cursing mob that no weapon could be wielded to advantage, and none of the Arabs dared use a firearm for fear of wounding one of his compatriots. Finally, Tarzan succeeded in seizing one of the most persistent of his attackers. With a quick wrench, he disarmed the fellow, and then, holding him before them as a shield, he backed slowly beside Abdul toward the little door which led into the inner courtyard. 
At the threshold, he paused for an instant, and, lifting the struggling Arab over his head, hurled him, as though from a catapult, full in the faces of his on-pressing fellows. Then, Tarzan and Abdul stepped into the semi-darkness of the court. The frightened dancing girls were crouching at the tops of the stairs which led to their respective rooms, the only light in the courtyard coming from the sickly candles which each girl had stuck with its own grease to the woodwork of her doorframe, the better to display her charms to those who might happen to traverse the dark enclosure. Scarcely had Tarzan and Abdul emerged from the room ere a revolver spoke close at their backs from the shadows beneath one of the stairways, and, as they turned to meet their new antagonist, two muffled figures sprang toward them, firing as they came. Tarzan leaped to meet these two new assailants. The foremost lay, a second later, in the trampled dirt of the court, disarmed and groaning from a broken wrist. Abdul's knife found the vitals of the second in the instant that the fellow's revolver missed fire as he held it to the faithful Arab's forehead. The maddened horde within the café were now rushing out in pursuit of their quarry. The dancing girls had extinguished their candles at the cry from one of their number, and the only light within the yard came feebly from the open and half-blocked door of the café. Tarzan had seized a sword from the man who had fallen before Abdul's knife, and now he stood waiting for the rush of men that was coming in search of them through the darkness. Suddenly, he felt a light hand upon his shoulder from behind, and a woman's voice whispering, Quick, monsieur, this way, follow me. Come, Abdul, said Tarzan in a low tone to the youth. We can be no worse off elsewhere than we are here. The woman turned and led them up the narrow stairway that ended at the door of her quarters. Tarzan was close beside her. He saw the gold and silver bracelets upon her bare arms, the strings of gold coins that depended from her hair ornaments, and the gorgeous colors of her dress. He saw that she was a dancing girl, and instinctively knew that she was the same who had whispered the warning in his ear earlier in the evening. As they reached the top of the stairs, they could hear the angry crowd searching the yard beneath. "'Soon they will search here,' whispered the girl. "'They must not find you, for though you fight with the strength of many men, they will kill you in the end. Hasten, you can drop from the farther window of my room to the street beyond. Before they discover that you are no longer in the court of the building, you will be safe within the hotel.' But, even as she spoke, several men had started up the stairway at the head of which they stood. There was a sudden cry from one of the searchers. They had been discovered. Quickly, the crowd rushed for the stairway— the foremost assailant leaped quickly upward, but at the top he met the sudden sword that he had not expected. The quarry had been unarmed before. With a cry, the man toppled back upon those behind him. Like tenpins, they rolled down the stairs. The ancient and rickety structure could not withstand the strain of this unwanted weight and jarring. With a creaking and rending of breaking wood, it collapsed beneath the Arabs, leaving Tarzan, Abdul, and the girl alone upon the frail platform at the top. Come, cried the dancing girl. They will reach us from another stairway through the room next to mine. We have not a moment to spare. Just as they were entering the room, Abdul heard and translated a cry from the yard below for several to hasten to the street and cut off escape from that side. We are lost now, said the girl simply. We? questioned Tarzan. Yes, monsieur, she responded. They will kill me as well. Have I not aided you? This put a different aspect on the matter. Tarzan had rather been enjoying the excitement and danger of the encounter. He had not for an instant supposed that either Abdul or the girl could suffer except through accident, and he had only retreated just enough to keep from being killed himself. He had no intention of running away until he saw that he was hopelessly lost were he to remain. Alone, he could have sprung into the midst of the close-packed mob, and, laying about him after the fashion of Numa the lion, have struck the Arabs with such consternation that escape would have been easy. Now he must think entirely of these two faithful friends. He crossed to the window which overlooked the street. In a minute there would be enemies below. Already he could hear the mob clambering up the stairway to the next quarters. They would be at the door beside him in another instant. He put a foot upon the sill and leaned out, but he did not look down. Above him, within arm's reach, was the low roof of the building. He called to the girl. She came and stood beside him. He put a great arm about her and lifted her across his shoulder. Wait here until I reach down for you from above, he said to Abdul. In the meantime, shove everything in the room against that door. It may delay them long enough. 
Then he stepped to the sill of the narrow window, with the girl upon his shoulders. Hold tight, he cautioned her. A moment later, he had clambered to the roof above with the ease and dexterity of an ape. Setting the girl down, he leaned far over the roof's edge, calling softly to Abdul. The youth ran to the window. Your hand, whispered Tarzan. The men in the room beyond were battering at the door. With a sudden crash, it fell splintering in, and at the same instant, Abdul felt himself lifted like a feather onto the roof above. They were not a moment too soon, for as the men broke into the room which they had just quitted, a dozen more rounded the corner in the street below and came running to a spot beneath the girl's window. Alrighty, thank you guys for listening today, and uh, I love going through these books, it's so much fun, so much fun to just uh, experience the adventure and hope you're enjoying it. I did want to give a huge shout out to our patrons, to Mike, Corky, Aaron, and Etiosa, thank you so much for supporting the podcast, it means so much to have you guys on board, and if you would like to become a supporter of the podcast, you can do that by going to anotherworldaudiobooks.com, and you may ask, like, why, why would I do that? You're already giving me free audiobooks, and... Like, I, I can just get the free audiobooks by coming on here. Why would I become a supporter of the podcast? Well, let me tell you. Because if you do, I will be able to make more free audiobooks. And the podcast will be able to continue. But uh, on, on, on another note, if you become a patron, depending on what level you get, uh, there's awesome stickers with custom designs that show off your love of the podcast. There are hoodies, there are t-shirts, there are all kinds of awesome things that you can get by becoming a patron. So go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com, click on uh, uh, support the podcast, I think it is, and that'll take you to the Patreon and you'll be able to see all the different levels that you can sign up for and all the benefits that come from that. And not only do you get swag, but you also get free audiobooks. So we've got quite the collection of audiobooks that we've done over the years here, which has been a lot of fun. And uh, you you can get parts of those collection uh, for free just sent right to you by becoming a patron and uh, if you get the top level you basically get all the audiobooks that we have in our library which is a pretty good deal so if you want to do that just go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com click on support this podcast i uh, cannot thank you enough for listening cannot thank you enough for sharing the podcast that is really the biggest thing i know it doesn't always work uh to become a patron of like if you were a patron of all the podcasts that ask you to be patrons you would be doing nothing but being patrons um but if you if it's not for you if you don't uh, feel like that that works right now that's totally fine all i ask is you just help me spread the word tell other people about the podcast that is the best way to help us grow and help us uh, continue to bring you awesome free audiobooks so thanks again for listening guys we will catch you next week week.